I was listening to the story about, it was a story of a family in Washington and the little boy called the Bigfoot the Cowboy Man. And he had, apparently it had made an effort to steal this kid. And it hit me. My children were in that playpen behind me with nothing but a mosquito net over them. It could have crept up behind me and taken both of my children and I wouldn't have known. father just got like a Mustang or something from Wyoming, okay? He had it out in the corral because he couldn't put it in the barn, with the, in the stalls with the other horses. It would kick and made all the other horses nervous. Had a Seminole Indian working the horse trying to break it every day. So they had it out in the corral. This skunk ape snuck up behind this horse and grabbed it on its hind quarters. This particular horse kicks out, jumps over the corral, runs into the pasture, you know, to get away. At this point, the rancher's out there just blasted away with the dirty, dirty. Skunk ape runs into the swamp. I went up there uh, one day after that, or two days after that, I went up there and sat in silence up there and it i'm telling you man it was free it was crazy you know it was it, there was a crazy vibe up there still i did what i could to kind of get things under control but i told her i said you need to get off this property i, I feel like no matter how strong you are it's almost like standing in the ocean you can't stand still without moving your feet you're going to get knocked over eventually no matter how strong whatever it, you, you can't withstand a barrage of, of weird spiritual energy What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Paranormal Odyssey. I'm your host, Wayne, joined as always by my partner in crime, Miss Tiffany. How are you doing tonight, ma'am? I'm good. I'm good. Had a really good day, so it's always a good ending to the day to be here with you guys. Yes, yes, I could not agree more. You said earlier that you were driving and have been driving for a while. What, what were you out doing? We went out to um, Blacksburg, Virginia, and it was my sister-in-law's um, big 29th birthday today, and so we surprised her. And Who celebrates 29? <laughs> you know, I never, if you would have asked me how old she was, I, I would have told you she's my age and been really confident with that answer, and I was so wrong. But she just, she just doesn't, yeah, she doesn't look, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if she's celebrating 29, she better have a hell of a bash for 30. <laughs> no, she's actually 50 today. <laughs> so oh, we, okay. <laughs> yeah, quote unquote 29. Um, no, she, um, I never would have thought her to be 50, however, so but yeah, it was it was fun. It was a good drive. It wasn't rainy or anything like that. But it was over an hour driving. Two I've heard of Blacksburg. <clears throat> Blacks. said Blacksburg, Blacksburg, Virginia. Black, Blacksburg. Blacksburg, Virginia. Uh huh. Is that where Virginia Tech was? It is. That is actually yeah. That is where Tech is. Yeah. Okay, that's how I know it. It is. <laughs> cool. Sex, I, can't you reveal, I can't believe you revealed her actual age. She's not going to watch this. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, leave it to me to all of my geography knowledge is wrapped around. <laughs> like, well, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you where Blackbird was. I, you know, I, I could get lost in a wet paper bag. So... I mean, their house is a little ways up from where Zach runs calls in Elliston. So I knew where his station was, and it's just straight up from there. But listen, I get lost so easy. I am directionally challenged. So I had my okay. Apple Maps on, and I'm like, okay, well, I don't drive the interstate because people are stupid. Um, so we'll just go to the one with the less turns. That put me on a road called, um, I think, Den Hill. And it is like nothing but this. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Next time we'll go the other way. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. 
but it, it was not your uh risk your life on the interstate sometimes it's worth it uh-uh no interstate for me no i, I miss, mentioned you know my love for sports and as we speak right now you know, you and I were, well, I joked with you before, a few hours before coming on, telling you that we might have to push the start back, the start of the show back a little bit because Tennessee is playing Texas right now in the NCAA tournament to uh, see who goes to the Sweet 16 next weekend. So uh, I will be checking my phone periodically. And that's a testament to you guys to, to show you how much I love y'all and how I did not cancel the show. I did not postpone. Uh, I'm going to hang in there and do it when my beloved balls are playing. But wish them luck. And I will be checking my phone periodically. <laughs> to check be the strong, school. man. If they, if they screw up and you start swearing, we're going to know why. <laughs> you will. I'll, I'll try to mute it in time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All that right. sounds great. We are... We're already six and a half minutes in. We ain't even paid the bills yet. We got Miss Naomi Finn hanging out backstage with a very, very interesting story that we're going to talk about. So let's get through these real quick. Okay. Guys, if you have not done so already, please hit that subscribe button. Has it popped up yet? Where is it? Oh, that's the ticker. There you go. <laughs> Guys, hit that subscribe button. If you have not done so already, we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And if you would like to come on with me and Wayne, we have three spots left for May. That's it. We're completely booked for April and we're almost completely booked for May. So if you want to come on with us, Wayne at ParanormalWorldProductions.com or Tiffany at ParanormalWorldProductions.com. All right. And that ParanormalWorldProductions.com is our website. Ask that you head over there and check that out. We get some merch. I can hear some kind of echo or something in the background. I don't like that. But maybe it's nothing. But uh, yeah, head over to paranormalworldproductions.com. Check out the other shows. We get some merch. All of that good stuff. Tell them why it's interesting. And as always, if you have any questions, put them in all capital letters. This is a pretty intriguing case. That we're going to discuss so if you put them in all caps we'll grab them and set them aside for the end yeah i think that's been working out really really well i'm glad yeah. that, that we started doing that um all right one more thing before we bring Naomi out uh, i want to mention our membership uh we still are about 20 or so away from hitting that 50 mark if you would like a chance to win a Yeti lunchbox and autograph copy of our guest tonight, book Naomi, one of Naomi Finn's book, and our producer's book, who's also going to be on tonight, The Unfamiliars, and a Paranormal Odyssey t shirt. We would like to have an opportunity to win that package. We would love for you to do that. All you have to do is dish out that $1.99 a month to be a member. Yeah, I ain't even thought about that. Tonight, we're going to have both authors on the show. So that's pretty cool. That is very cool. Yes, yes, yes. See, oh, we are so much better than basketball. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> As a whole, probably, the March Madness basketball is pretty stellar. That's the only time I really like it right now. I may have to virtually just backhand you, but okay. Are you frozen? No. Are you frozen? You look like you were frozen. Nope. Is Naomi Finn frozen? I don't know. Nope, she's moving. I see her. She's shaking her head, so I think that's our cue to uh, go ahead and get her out of here. Are you ready? I am. Right. One of my favorite people on this planet, Miss <laughs> Naoma Finn. How are you doing, man? I am fantastic, and I just want you to know that I love celebrating 29 so much. I've done it 30 more times. 
<laughs> I just keep you celebrating know, 29. That's fun. Yes. You don't look a day over 29, man. <laughs> oh, gray haired at 29. That'd be scary. I'd shoot myself. I like my gray hair now, but I wouldn't have liked it then. Well, in fact, I've had this little patch here since I was about 17, so I can tell you I didn't like it then. <laughs> <laughs> I know we were talking about. Right. Let me uh, let me interrupt real quick here. If I am not mistaken, Susan Sullinger is the lady that's putting on our the event that you and I will be speaking at. Later oh, this year. cool! She just became a member. Thank Woo. you, thank you. We were just talking about her. Let and me know. Good things. We were just talking about her right right before we came on. We were talking about you and you. Naomi and I were texting earlier today talking about you and talking about, about the event. Uh, let me know if that's you, Sam. I'm pretty sure it is. But, yeah, awesome. I'm so glad to have you as a member. Cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very, 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 very cool. Naomi, uh, I Wayne. said it as a problem. <laughs> Wayne, I said I it as a problem. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> no, no, no. Talking about when no, no. gets drunk, how ugly it is. I had to share it with everybody. Yeah, you guys have no, to be there. Has been, she's been drinking tonight. <laughs> yeah. Naomi was giving us a uh, <laughs> Naomi was giving us a play-by-play -play example of what happens when she becomes intoxicated. And that I was, just love everybody. <laughs> that was a break. <laughs> <laughs> That was the cleanest part. <laughs> yeah. But as I was saying, ma'am, uh, as we brought you on, I mentioned one of my favorite people, and that is you. Uh, you and I become really quick friends uh, when I talk to you about doing the. Uh, call call me mama because uh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> He's still drunk, y'all. <laughs> oh, shoot. Sadly, no. <laughs> Can you imagine what drunk would really be? <laughs> uh, I was telling her, you know, Naomi is going to speak at our Squatch Out this year. She's going to do the campfire story again, so I'm going to have to slip her some rum in her drink or <laughs> something. You just want to see it fall all to pieces, don't you? All right. Okay. Well, I think it'd on. be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's jump into this topic that we're going to be talking about tonight: the uh, the Bennington Triangle. Uh, you purpose. caught my interest. You caught my interest with this whole person disappearing on a moving bus. So I've been waiting to to hear the whole story. So, ma'am, the the floor is yours. Please take off. Keep talking for 30 seconds because I just realized I printed that and forgot to get it off the printer. Hang on. Okay. Uh, Susan, Susan just confirmed that that is her. Can't wait to meet you all in person. Yeah, well, and Susan, actually, I spent some time today practicing my casting ability. So, <laughs> been working on that. So, all right, ma'am. Are you ready? Okay, yes, I am. Now, I want to let you guys all know, first and foremost, that the Bennington Triangle is a new topic for me. I just recently learned, um, probably just six or seven months ago about it, how I found out about the Bennington Triangle is there's a lady named, she she has a Facebook page called Lisa Lycan X, L-Y-C-A-N-X. And if you've been, Lenita Bryant, hello. Um, if you have been, uh, a, a member of this community for any period of time, especially in the dog man uh, aspect, you've probably heard her on a different sh on occasional shows talking about her encounters with dog men growing up as a child. And she grew up in the middle of the Bennington Triangle. And how I had overlooked this is I had sworn that a long time ago she had told me it was the Bridgewater Triangle. And a few months ago, she corrected me. And I thought, well, that's a triangle I hadn't heard of. So I started doing some research. And let me tell you about some of the just crazy, crazy things about this. 
But I want to warn you because it's a new topic. I don't have everything committed to memory. My stories may not be on point, but I do have tons and tons of notes. So we're, we're good with that. Um, the Bennington Triangle is located in southern Vermont, and it's centered around Glastonbury Mountain. It involves towns like um, Bennington and Somerset and Woodford and Glastonbury. And even before Europeans came to this area, the Native Americans there had legends and lores about it. They wouldn't step foot on this mountain unless it was to bury their dead. They believed it was cursed. They believed that at the top of this mountain was where all the four winds came together and all the four winds blew at once. And the, the most bizarre story that they had about it was that the top of this mountain is a rock. And they believed that if you got up to the top of the mountain, people would want to climb up on the rock to look around and get a view of where they were at. But if you even got near the rock, much less on it, the rock would swallow you whole and you would never be seen again. And this is before Europeans ever even came to the area. Um, so when the Europeans did settle it, and I believe it was originally settled in 1761, um, they, it was not a happy area. It's never, especially the town of Glastonbury, it was never an area where people would you know, the, always there were mishaps. There was always troubles and sorrows. And um, except for a brief period in the 1800s when it had a lumber boom and uh, and they basically denuded the mountain in the process, it was never a well-populated area. And by 1937, they got down to having seven people in Glastonbury. And so they it became unincorporated. The government took away their there, whatever it is that you take away from a town to make it no longer incorporated. Now, today there's still about six people that live there. And I will be honest with you, one guy who lives there says he grew up on that mountain. He has snowmobiled up and down that mountain. He skied it. He's fished it. He's hunted it. He's hiked it, everything since he was a small child. And he's never seen or heard anything weird. But he would be the exception to the rule <laughs> in this particular case. Um, I wanted to read to you a newspaper article I found from the Bennington Banner. It was published um, by on October 4, 2008. The writer was John D. Weller. Um, just to give you an idea of just how crazy this place is. Robert Singley got lost in the Bennington Triangle on Sunday night. But unlike some who were lost before him, the Bennington College music composition teacher lived to tell a story. Right before I lost the trail, everything like crescendoed into this weird sort of dizzying confusion, Singley said Thursday. It just suddenly got dark. And then it was like, where am I? What's going on? I was totally lost. Singley, 27, went out for a day hike on Sunday at, off of Harbor Road in Woodford Hollow, the exact same place where Paula Weldon, who we will talk about in a minute, who was a Bennington College sophomore, was last seen 62 years ago, which has been longer now because this was in 2008. He was planning to do some composing. He'd been working um, on a string quartet. After eating lunch on top of Bald Mountain, he walked a short distance along the ridge line north towards Glastonbury, turned back, checked out the white rocks to the west, which was his landmark, and then started heading back east towards his car. He walked for four or five miles. He should have been at his car within three miles. I swear I was walking on the right trail, he said. That's when the fog rolled in and it started getting dark. Singly, wearing heavy boots, long shorts, a long sleeve shirt with a wool sweater and rain jacket, a winter hat and mittens on the cold, rainy night, pulled his headlamp from his pack. It was broken. He had no compass, no GPS, no map, not even a watch. Unable to locate the trail, Singly found refuge under a large maple. I was kind of like drawn to it in the night, he said. It was really expelling a weird sort of, I don't know, a really weird haunting energy, whatever that means. 
An unexperienced hiker, I'm sorry, an experienced hiker, singly stayed calm and tried to get some rest. However, he was too cold and wet to fall asleep. He started to work on a fire, but he kept stumbling upon large animal bones in his blind search for wood. He finally came across some dry birch and was able to start a fire with matches and pages of a composition book he had in his pack. The night was eerily quiet other than the loon-like call of a lone fisher cat. He started worrying, but only about his fiancée worrying about him. At this point, she had already called police, but the search was suspended until morning due to dark, foggy conditions. The sun would come up eventually, he thought, and then he would find his way. Once it was light enough, Singly, disoriented from the previous night, attempted to walk back toward his car. After three or four miles, he reached a wilderness sign. He was near the Goddard Shelter, almost at the peak of Glastonbury Mountain. I thought I was camped about a quarter mile from my car, he said, and instead I woke up totally on the other end of this ridge, literally six or seven miles away from where I thought I was. I didn't make any, it didn't make any logical sense at all. Singley started walking back. He passed the maple but then the trail seemed completely foreign, like he had never been there before. Down trees crossed the trail. The pines looked different. It was stuff I, could, I wouldn't have missed, he said. A short while later, at 11.30 a.m. on Monday, he was found by Vermont State Police. However, his morning location still remains a mystery to him. Either I took a side trail, which doesn't really make sense, he said, or something weird happened. So that's just an idea of how creepy this place is and the strange things that go on there. And um, and I'll get back to the disappearances later, but there have always been UFO sightings. There have always been weird lights. There have always been ghost stories. And, of course, there's the thing called, some people call it the Glastonbury Monster and other people call it the Bennington Monster. And as you might guess, it's, it's a big, Bigfoot type creature. It was first sighted um, back in the 1800s, mid-1800s, by a couple of uh, hunters. They were out in the woods. They had gone there to uh, you know, hunt, <laughs> so they had rifles with them. They're walking along, and they see this big hairy creature, two-legged, come run, you know, walking out. And of course, they look at it, and you know, uh, naturally, being hunters, you know, what else are you going to do? They shot at it, you know, because like, hey, Bubba, what's that? Well, I don't know, Marvin, but I think I'm going to kill it. And that's what they did. They shot at it and they actually hit the thing, but they didn't kill it. They really just pissed it off. And so this thing charges them. Now, I want you to remember, this is the 1800s when a man's rifle is his meal ticket. These two men were so scared, they dropped their guns and they ran just to get away from it. They were that afraid of it. And of course, you know, their story made the news, the local news, and everybody probably had a good laugh over it. But the men were convinced that they had seen a creature that they had no idea what it was. Now, it wasn't too long after this, and I think this happened around, I want to say 1871, 1879, sometime in that time frame. There was a stagecoach headed down a rainy, muddy, road of course nothing was paved back then and it was raining pretty good and or it had rained i don't think it was raining at the time but it had rained so the road was pretty muddy and yucky and they got to a point where they had to stop and look at the road because it was really bad so the driver gets off the stage and he climbs down and he happens to notice that all around this big patch of mud that he's trying to figure out how to get around there's these ginormous footprints they're like, they're huge. There's no way that a human being could have footprints that big. And while he's standing there looking at, of course, the people in the stagecoach, they get out and they come around. They're all standing there looking around. This thing that's over six feet tall, and I know that doesn't sound especially tall to us today, but it must have been a behemoth to them because only in the last, what, 50 years has six feet become fairly normal. Um that you know this comes charging out of the woods and it's so angry with them that it knocked over it put the stagecoach on its side now nobody was hurt they all got away okay but i mean that's a pretty strong creature that could knock a stagecoach on its side 
And that creature is still, I mean, it's seen all the time, even today, and as, as recently as um, 2003, there was a man who happened to be out in the woods and he saw this big reddish looking bipedal creature walking uh, across the road in front of him and, and went up into the woods. Now, the local authorities and the, the experts all said, oh, you just saw a bear. And the man said, well, maybe so. But that was a very talented bear because it, it never went down on all fours. And it didn't seem to have any kind of problem walking. It walked very, very well. And as you know, a bear can do that, but they really don't do it <laughs> overly well. So um, there have always been these kind of crazy things. But the thing I think that is the most... Um, terrifying is the disappearances. And that's really what I'm here to talk about. Now, there are a couple of disappearances that happened in this time frame. One was in 1942. 13-year-old Melvin Hills basically walked into the woods one day and never came out. They never found him. They never figured out what happened to him. He just walked into the woods and disappeared. And if you've ever been up in the Green Mountains, Wayne, do you want to bring up that map? Yeah. If you've ever been um, in the Green Mountains, you'll know that uh, it's a really heavily forested, deeply, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's remote. It may not look all that remote, but it really is remote. The western point of that triangle actually is Albany, New York. So it's, it's, it's not unpopulated, mind you. But it's definitely um, a dense area. And by the way, that little excerpt I took, the the red point where it says Robert Singley's starting point, that is where the map showed me where that road is. If you see there's sort of a darkness that follows the river up there, that's the holler that he was walking. Now, he probably didn't park that far down the holler. He was probably quite a bit closer because it's like 17 miles from so probably halfway between that red marker and the green one which is where goddard shelter is is where he probably parked but that is the area that he was in and if you see glastonbury is to the north of that and you can see where glastonbury is on the vermont map you can kind of get an idea of um woodford was just south of him and then Somerset is sort of to the north northeast of him there. But um, it's a, it's not a, a, a it's not necessarily um, an unpopulated area, but it's very densely forested. So in 1942, this kid may have just got lost. Who knows? I, and again, in um, 1946, there were three hunters from Massachusetts who did basically the same thing. They were hunting on Glastonbury Mountain. They went out for their daily hunt, and they just never came back. And um, so you're going to find a lot of stories about that uh, when you start looking into Bennington and or the Bennington Triangle and all of the uh, disappearances there. But there are five disappearances in particular that are just beyond strange. Um, the first one is a guy, he was a 74-year-old man. It happened November 12th of 1945. And pay attention to these dates because they kind of, they'll, they'll interest you, I think. His name was Mitty Rivers. Now, Mitty Rivers was 74 he was an experienced hunter. Not only was he an experienced hunter, this man was a hunting guide. He took other people out. In fact, he was out with four other hunters that day. And I've heard, I've read, I've heard, I've, I've looked at different versions of the story. The one that seems to be the most common is he was walking down a path with his son-in-law, which was one of the other uh, hunters. And, um, they reached a fork in the path and he said, I'm going to go down this. I'm going to explore this path. I won't go very far. I'll meet you back at camp at three o'clock. We'll eat a little something. And, and uh, so three o'clock comes and goes and, and the son-in-law sitting in camp with the other hunters and Mitty Rivers doesn't show up anyway. So, you know, they, they wait and he doesn't show up and he doesn't show up and he doesn't show up. And so they go out looking for him. They can't find him. And so they, 
they call in the police and they begin a rescue, uh, you know, a search party and they search and search and search. The only thing they ever found of Mitty Rivers was a rifle casing. And they think what happened was it was in the bottom of the river. They think he may have leaned over it and it fell out of his pocket, but they never found a hide or hair of his body. They, they couldn't trace him. Nothing. He was just gone. Now, Naomi, he says they found a rifle casing or a rifle bullet? A rifle, rifle casing. A casing? That would suggest he shot. A spent, right. A spent round. Um, I my, my mind went the same place yours did, Wayne. When I saw, read the word casing, I thought, well, that's a spent round, right? But mm -hmm. there's no indication in any of the encounters that I read that they thought he fired his his gun um if he did he was not so far away from their camp that they shouldn't have been able to hear the gun go off when he did okay. uh, i don't know it, you know maybe he picked up the casing after he fired earlier and dropped it in his pocket uh okay. it's there's no real it's really hard to find in these older newspapers um a lot of detail a lot of the detail you'd like to have now, there's a man, the man who actually named the area, is uh, his name's Joseph Citro, C-I-T-R-O. And he's a writer, and he wrote a book about it in 1992. And I think he went up there, he actually went through the, the, the archives, visited the historical society, the library, the things that Wade and Tiffany and I were actually talking about that are fun to do. And I think that that's what he did. And he wrote a really interesting book on it. And I think he's a lot more detailed and um, I have the book on order, <laughs> but of course it hasn't come yet. But um, so then we go forward. That was in November 12th of 1945, December 1st of 1946. Um, what that's a year and maybe two or three weeks later. There was a young college student. Her name was Paula Weldon. She was 18 years old. She worked at the, she was obviously a student at Bennington College. And yeah, that's her. And she worked at the canteen or maybe she worked at the bookstore. I don't remember where she worked, but she worked at the college. And uh, she just finished her shift, finished her shift. And she decided she was just going to go for a walk, clear her head, you know, enjoy the day. She takes off on her walk. She is seen on the trail by one man who she had actually stopped and asked directions from. And then she's seen on the trail for, by a couple who saw her walking in front of them. And she rounded a, a turn in the, in the path. And by the time they got around that same turn, she was gone. That was the last time that she was ever seen. And this is just off of, what is the name of that road that I said earlier that uh, Singley was on? Um, uh, something hollow road, Woodford hollow, yeah. I believe road or no, uh, th that's, he was on Woodford hollow, but, uh, the road was until I'm, ex I'm really organized and prepared for this in my defense. I didn't know I was going to be on the show until a couple of days ago. So, um, okay. another, another cancellation. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have out of you wing my bad no, you're but, fine. Um, harbor road it's just after she crossed harbor road and she was never seen again she was wearing a bright red jacket so she should have been easily found at least her body should have been you know stood out if it if she had had a fall or if an animal had attacked her there would have been some kind of traces of clothing or blood or body parts there was nothing they never found her now, her case wound up making national news, and so she is actually the most famous uh, disappearance off of Glastonbury or um, out of the Bennington Triangle. But um, there's no evidence that there was absolutely no evidence. And interesting, interestingly, Shirley Jackson actually wrote a book called uh, Hangs a Man, which is actually based on her disappearance. Of course, it's a fictionalized version, but so that was December 1st of 1946, right? December 1st of 1949, we have James Tedford 
And this is the one that I think is just the most bizarre story I've ever heard. James Tedford was a 68-year-old war veteran. He was living in the Bennington's Old Soldier's Home, back when they called it an Old Soldier's Home. And uh, he happened to be visiting family up in St. Albans, which is at the clear northern part of Vermont. He happened to be up there visiting. They took him to the bus station. He got on the bus. Um, I'm sorry, that was my phone. Uh, he gets on the bus. Bus takes off. They make a couple of stops. They get to Bennington, and he's not there. People say, well, no, we saw him on the bus after the last stop. He was on the bus. He was definitely on the bus. We saw him there. Paid passenger after passenger was interviewed. They all saw him on the bus, even after the last stop. But when they got to Bennington, all that was left of him was his bus route timetable. And I think maybe his ticket. He was never seen again. How do you explain that? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, his luggage was on the bus too. Uh, but he was nowhere to be seen. He had just simply vanished. Now, I will tell you that there's a discrepancy between the amount of time the day he vanished and the day that it was reported that he vanished is about a week. Um, and so the people that they interviewed actually had a week to forget about the trip. Yeah. But I don't think that when you pull however many people were on that bus into a room and to a person, they all say, no, I saw him uh, on the bus after the last stop, that I don't think that there's too many people that agree with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, at least one person would have had yeah. a the, Yeah, they would have said. And, and the other thing is, there was never anything found of him, nothing. And, and like he didn't show up 20 years later someplace having a new life. They didn't find remains anywhere. They didn't find any indication that uh, he actually, he was living in the old so soldier's home, but according to newspaper articles, he was actually visiting his wife in St. Albans. So there, he was not living with his wife. So, if he was trying to escape her, it wasn't necessary. He was living a state away from her. If he wanted to go back to her, he would have gotten back to her or they would have found him somewhere in, in between, dead or injured. They found nothing. It was like the bus passed through a portal and sucked him out of it. And it was just, just like that. He was gone. So now we're going to go to almost a year later, October 12th of 1950. Little Paul Jepson was an eight-year-old boy. He was the son of farmers. Uh, his mom and dad also took care of the local dump. Um, he, mom had put him in the truck. She was going out to take care of the hogs. She drives out to where she's got to go get out of the truck and slap the hogs. It's 1950. This is a time before everybody had to be a helicopter parent. And she's like, don't get out of the truck. I'll be back, you know, as soon as I can. She's gone for an hour doing her job. She comes back. He's gone. Of course, the first thought is, well, he's eight years old. He got out of the truck and wandered into the woods. So they, you know, she starts calling for him. Her screams are what drew other people there. And, and they formed a search party and they began to search and they searched for miles around the entire area, literally far more than a little eight-year-old kid is going to go in that time frame. They got cert they, they got out bloodhounds to follow him and they followed his scent. His scent disappeared on what is the name of the road? Harbor Road. The last place that Paula um, Weldon was seen. The other interesting thing is Paul Jepson was wearing a red coat when he disappeared. Same as Paula Weldon was. Mm -hmm. So now we go to um, just two weeks later. October 28th, 1950. And we have Frida Langer. 
Now, Frida Langer, she was 53 years old. She was an experienced hiker. She was actually out hiking and hunting on a hiking and hunting trip with her husband and her cousin. And she, she, they had kind of gone out in the woods. She wasn't expecting to go that far. They got to a certain point and she realized they were going to go quite a bit farther. And she said to her cousin who she was with, her husband was back at camp. She said to her husband or her cousin, you know, I'm not dressed for this. I need to run back and I need to put on different clothes, different pair of shoes. Stay here. I'll be back in 15, 20 minutes. Well, he waits and he waits and he waits and she doesn't come back and she doesn't come back. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, he is so frustrated. He comes charging back into camp. He's stomping around and he's looking around. He's like, why did Frida leave me out there? Why did she leave me all by myself out there in the woods alone with nothing? And yeah, I'm sitting out there for hours. Where the hell is she? And her husband's like, well, she didn't come back here. Nobody saw her. They didn't see her leave. They, they didn't see her come back. She didn't cross anybody on the trail. She simply vanished. Of the five people that I call the canonical five, um, she's the only one whose body was found. And it was found May, I think May 12th of 1951. So seven, eight months later. They found her body in deplorable condition. Of course, imagine, I mean, it sat out there in the woods all winter. I'm sure there was a lot of, of, of um, decaying going on and a lot of feeding going on, but it looked like she had been mutilated. She was just torn to pieces. Now, there was a serial killer who in the late 1800s had, um, he had killed, I think he was an ax murderer and they had put him in uh, a mental institution he had escaped, I think, in the 1920s and had just basically disappeared into the mountains. Some people say he's another victim of the mountain. Some people say that's where he hid out and that these people, and part of why people say that is because of the, the cluster of dates. The dates all occur in October, November, December. And it, when you look into the psychology of serial killers, there are certain things they might, you know, um, you can, some serial killers, you can almost count the days and know that this is the next, some serial killers only, uh, you know, attack on a full moon or some only certain times a year. And so a lot of people argue that that's part of, uh, or, you know, that this is just a serial killer. But by the time you get to 2024 and you look at all of the disappearances that have happened on Glastonbury Mountain, and there have been a staggering number of disappearances on Glastonbury Mountain, that serial killer would have to be over 100 years old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and really, probably even going on 200. So, yeah, I don't <laughs> think it was a serial killer. A lot of people think that it's paranormal forces. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, there's just some kind of uh, demonic energy. Um, there have been reports of demonic activity, much like with the Bridgewater Triangle, mm -hmm. which is another triangle that I find really fascinating in Massachusetts. There was a demonic cult that was operating in this area. Um, there are people who say that, uh, there may have, this might be interdimensional phenomenon that, um, or phenomena multiples, um, that, you know, these people are simply walking through portals. Yeah. If I, if that's the case though, wouldn't everybody on that bus have disappeared if the bus that's passed through a portal? Mm -hmm. And that's, that is why I don't think that's what it is. Of course, there have been multiple UFO sightings in that region. There are, there's a, a story of a weird light that um, people see in that area. And so perhaps 
um, maybe it's this UFO abduction. And even before the Europeans came, the Native Americans talked about the strange lights and the strange things in the sky there. So it's a possibility that this is UFO abduction. Um, I, I would be more inclined to believe that. And of course, there is the, uh, the Bennington monster. Now, there is kind of a funny story. There was actually the wild man of Glastonbury. This was a guy who back in, uh, gosh, I don't, I never wrote down a date, but this is a real person. He was sort of a, he was a local guy, not quite right in the head, lived in a cave up on Glastonbury Mountain. We come down to town wearing nothing but a trench coat and he'd flash all the ladies and, and he'd wave around a pistol. You know, if you tell the police, I'm going to shoot you. Now, um, Naomi, you said that he's, with him. <laughs> Naomi, you said he's not quite right. What, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, you know, to each that their own. Like right? my, that sounds like my Saturday. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. What do you guys think? I just ran through everything because I I'm a little wired and you know been drinking. Well, I didn't mention it. I didn't mention it at the beginning because we were in a hurry to get you out, but. Tonight, our poll question, and since you, you were just talking about it, uh, portals. Our poll question tonight is, are portals to blame for some of these missing person cases? We've had 15 votes, and overwhelming, you know, 73% say yes. I think portals can be to blame. But, as you stated, Naoma, the gentleman on the bus, how the hell did he go through a portal and no one else did? Exactly. That, well, maybe something blipped him out. Just, it's strange. It is. It, you know, the the one that I find actually, um, I think that has our answers for us is uh, Robert Singley. Is that his name? Singley, I think was his last name, mm -hmm. the college professor or the college teacher. Um I think he actually, if you really, if you sat down with him and really picked apart his story, I think you're going to find a lot of the answers. Now, I have to admit, and part of the reason why I don't go in the woods anymore is because I'm not very bright. Um, and I have been walking up a trail, straight up a, a, a well-marked trail, get to the point where I'm going to turn around. I start back down and I suddenly realize that the trail forks off this way but when I was coming up I didn't see that fork coming in and I've stood there thinking okay well which which fork did I come from and <laughs> and I've done that a few times and I found myself lost in the woods a few times because I'm not very bright and so I can see where that might have happened but he he's going back over his steps again and again and he's seeing trees down that weren't down before he's seeing you know he's seeing landmarks that make sense like the maple that he saw but then he's seeing trees that are down that shouldn't be down that he would have had to crawl over on the path he never saw that before uh, and he said he had this feeling this absolute feeling of uh you know that disorient disoriented uh uh, confusion. And so was he hit with ultrasound? Yeah. The, I mean, infrasound, infrasound, I infrasound not ultrasound, my bad. <laughs> I, <what> you mean. <laughs> I got you back. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Anthony <laughs> <laughs> is my caretaker. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I, I love you too. I love you. I do love you. I love you. <laughs> but but I wonder though if that's you know a correlation between all of these cases. You know, do they get turned around and and mm -hmm. not just these specific cases, but there are thousands and thousands when you dig into missing persons. Do they? I mean, is it something that is confusing them, disorientating? I mean, it's. It's just baffling. Yes. It, it is. I mean, and the only, the only body, the only one of the, of the ones that I've discussed besides 
the one who actually walked himself out of the woods and was found alive. The only body that they found was horribly mutilated. Um, and don't you hear of that? You have the UFOs that come down and horribly mutilate, mutilate yes. cows. Well, not only cows, but I don't know if you're familiar with the Cunningham incident in uh, White Plains in the 1950s. I'm not. Um, and I can never remember. It starts with a B and I can never remember the other guy's name. But uh, Cunningham was a major. The guy whose name starts with a B was a sergeant. They had done missile testing. It was their job to go out and pick up shrapnel and, and debris so that they could bring it back and test it. They get out there about dark. They park their Jeep. They start walking across the testing range. Of course, it's just sand dunes. That's all white plains. White, is it white plains? I'm not saying that right. White sands, silver, whatever it is. It's where they mm -hmm. do the testing in New, in New Mexico. By the way, also very close to where the Roswell incident happened. Mm -hmm. And so they're walking around after dark. Um, the, I wish I could think of his name. It makes me crazy because I knew a kid named Robert somebody. And if I could remember Robert's last time, I'd remember this guy's last time because it's the same. But um, he breaks off and he walks over a sand dune. Cunningham's thinking, okay, he's got to go relieve himself. I'm just going to keep walking. He'll catch up with me. After about 15 minutes, Cunningham is like, God, where the hell did this guy, you know, he didn't show back up. So he starts walking back and he gets back to the sand dune where the other guy went over, the sergeant went over the dune and he hears just crazy screaming and he thinks, oh, for the love of Pete, this guy's got himself bit by a rattlesnake. And now I'm going to have to deal with that. So he goes up over the dune as he crosses the, the crest of the dune. It's not a rattlesnake. He sees a UFO with a long metal arm coming out of it and it's got the other guy by the leg it's dragging him, and it literally eventually drags him up inside the UFO. Cunningham runs back to the Jeep, makes the call on the radio back to the base. They come out, they take him to the base, and they start questioning him because they're convinced that he had done some done this guy in. And um, he, uh, um, you know, they're they're like. So three days, this guy get que gets questioned while they search this entire area uh, looking for the missing man. They find his body 10 miles from where he disappeared. The time that Cunningham parked the Jeep, walked there, walked back, walked over the dune, went back to the Jeep and called it, was not enough time for him to have gone 10 miles done what was done to this man's body, and then drove back. They found this man, his eyes had been drilled out, his tongue was missing, and his anus had been drilled out, exactly like a cattle mutilation. Oh. So it happens to people, too. That is disturbing. That is extremely you, disturbing. You lost me at anus drill out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's... Uh, <laughs> Just well, some of the questions that uh, what were you going to say, Naomi? I was just going to point out that there are several cases like that that have popped up over the years in South America. There were two young men that were found by a dam in South America, I think, in uh, I want to say it was either Argentina or Colombia. Their bodies were found exactly the same way they tongues missing, eyes gone. Um, mm -hmm genitalia mutilated and, and whatnot and drilled out with precision not like oh we were going to torture these guys because they stole our drugs we are talking with precision there's actually a, a cryptid in south america that it uh translates to i believe a face peeler because mm. they are they find people whose faces have just completely been peeled off there the skin is, but all they have is a skeletal face remaining. I have heard that. I just, I think there is, I think there is just so much more when you really delve into this whole thing. I think it's almost like you're on the verge of figuring it all out. 
and then something comes in and throws a wrench in it. I just think there's more to all of these people going missing. Yes. Than they're just there's certainly. And I don't so. think there's a single answer. I really do think that, um, I think that some cases this may be what caused it. In some cases, this may be what caused it. I don't think that my story or what I believe is the only answer. I think that there are multiple things going on and that's why we'll never solve it because everybody wants one definitive answer and you're not going to get it. You're never right. going to get the one definitive answer. Right. Yeah. That's a very good point. All right. We're going to get to the questions, but before we do, we have some late breaking news. <laughs> is that final it is the final oh jeez <laughs> we are headed to the sweet 16 oh, yeah, right there, final look today. at how beautiful that is I don't want to take it down we were up by like 12 and then they Texas cut it to like I think 2 or something like that and I was I was really upset thought I was going to be throwing my phone in the in a live <laughs> on a live broadcast, but they held on and pulled it out. So congratulations, mighty volunteers. Woohoo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I I once told a lady that she's a um Oh, I don't know. It's, it's an SEC team and I don't know what college it is. They an elephant is there. I I collect elephants oh, and so she Alabama. Okay. She comes into my office and she sees all these elephants. She's like, Oh, are you an Alabama fan? I said, no, I'm not an SEC fan at all. I'm a big 10 person because I'm from the Midwest. And so she spent the rest of the time we worked together for two years telling everybody that I didn't know anything about football. And I used to announce football. <laughs> I didn't know anything about basketball. My son played on a traveling basketball team for 12 years. I've been to more basketball games in my life than I ever want to be ever again. I hated it. <laughs> but she, because I apparently didn't like the right team or the right conference. So, yeah. yeah. It happens. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right, let's get to some of these uh, questions. First one is Mr. Alex. A good buddy, Alex. Uh, if it was a cursed, if it was a cursed mountain, why would tribes bury their family? That's a good question, and I don't know if if that is the European concept of what they were saying. That Europeans called it cursed, and, and that they just thought it was a very magical place to be respected. I would go more with that if they're willing to bury their dead there, but that was the only time that they would come up on that mountain and they warned Europeans to stay away from there. So that is a very good question, but I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. Next question is from Troy. Is there any link to the missing individual relationships in case? So the only the only links are oddball things like the fact that Paula Weldon and Paul uh, whatever his last name was, the little boy, were both wearing red jackets. They were both found, or they were both mm -hmm. last seen in the same spot, and that happened to be the spot where um, the Singley guy, 62 years later, happened to walk into the woods. Um, so that's the connection. But did any of these people know each other? No. Most of them were people from uh, you know, Paula Weldon was an out-of-state person or an out-of-area person who come there to go to school. Um, Jepson was, Jepson, that was Paul Jepson was the little boy. He was a local. Uh, the hunter, Mitty Rivers, I believe that he had hunted that area frequently, but he was, I don't think he was a local. Um, uh, let me see who else. Frida um, Langdon was actually from Massachusetts. So, which is just south of there. It's not like it, it actually kind of dips down into. Uh, so I don't okay. think there there's any, the, you know, then they weren't all part of the same church. They didn't all drink the same Kool-Aid, anything like that. So. All right. Our next one is from Scott Trent. What is the date of the most recent disappearance? <sighs> well, it, it's it, you have to search through the papers. I I don't 
have any stories more recent than Singley's, which was in 2004. But there are references to dates far more recent than that. But finding the actual without names and without, you know, locations, it, it really gets a little bit tight. But if you go onto the um, missing persons website, you will find a pretty tight cluster in that area. And you can, but I don't, I couldn't give you an exact date of the most recent disappearance. Okay. All right, Mr. Ford, my good buddy Ford, Tennessee. Are there yes. any native accounts? Yes. The, the natives believed that they had, they, there was, they believed there was a rock on top of the mountain that if you got near the rock or, or especially if you stood on it, it would eat you. It would open up and swallow you whole. So oh, they yeah. had, before Europeans came, they had missing people. They, If somebody went missing who was up on that mountain, they would assume that that person got too close to that particular magical rock. And at that rock is where they believe that all the four winds blow at once. So they have, which would imply a, uh, uh, a knowledge of some kind of confusion that happens up there, uh, you know, the fogginess, the 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 feeling of where am I, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. And Bristol just, this, I'm glad you pulled that up. I mean, the waitress was mm -hmm. an attractive girl, so one could imagine some psycho targeting her. But the way she just disappeared, yeah, like the like that negates that, especially. If it was an impromptu walk she took. And I was thinking the same thing because she was an attractive young lady. Yes, she was. And, and yeah. yeah. And she was a responsible person. She wasn't pr prone. Help me, Tiffany. I, <laughs> still drunk, I can't talk. Anyway, no. <laughs> She wasn't prone to um, doing irresponsible things like just wandering away. Yeah. She she was a, a a good student. She was a pretty girl, and yes, it's I I think if you were going to assign any of the of those particular five cases to a serial killer, hers would be the one that I would assign. Mm -hmm. If I were going to assign any of the five cases to a cryptid attack, I would be Frida uh, Langdon, the last one. If I pieces. Yeah. If I were going to assign any of them to a UFO, it would be the man on the bus. Uh, mm -hmm. James Tedford. Um, yeah, but what's the chances of all of those happening in that one confined period? Exactly. And and so there has to be a connection. There has to be something that ties them all together. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to getting the book. Uh, and when I do, I'll let you know <laughs> what what he comes up with. Uh, he, I know that the book itself got a little bit of, um, there's a, a particular guy. He's one of those naysayers who, you know, look, the name of my channel is open to doubt because it's okay to doubt as long as you ask the questions. And yeah. this is one of those guys who rather than um, asks questions, just, oh, He's just one of those people. He's just trying to get points on his you know, sales on his book. That's all he's trying to do. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, no, he is exploring a very interesting topic. And maybe it's not interesting to this guy, but it's interesting to me. So there are a few people out there that have said that about his book, but I'm looking forward to reading it because I'd like to know what he thinks. I'd like to, there's another guy who wrote a book on it and I don't know his name. But he also wrote a book on the strange things that happen in southern Vermont. This is a very weird area. Even if you take the five disappearances out, you mm -hmm. still have um, the the Bigfoot. Um, and apparently, and this really frustrated me because apparently in 2003, there was an, a very uh, famous series of, of Bigfoot sightings that happened. And it was referred to as the Famous Bigfoot sightings of 2003. The most famous Bigfoot encounters. Do you think I could find one? <laughs> I searched the internet. I was looking through newspapers. I could not find anything to, to tell me exactly what happened. Other than one guy, one day, he's out hunting. He's walking up the road and a bipedal animal walked across the road in front of him. 
the authorities told him he saw a bear. Interestingly, he saw a, a very red bear, which would be what a grizzly in northeastern United States that would more inclined to be a black bear, wouldn't it? I think so. Right. So I would think. Yeah. All right. And so, one last time, I want to uh, notice Miss Susan Suffinger. Thank you so very much for becoming a member, ma'am. Naoma and myself, I believe I can speak to you, Naoma, when I say that we are both very excited about coming up to your event in Greenville, Ohio, this October. Thank you, ma'am. Absolutely, we are. And if you guys join, you get my book. And you have a chance at her book. Oh, that's Sorry. right. Yeah. My book's up here. <laughs> yep. I, I'm not a writer, so you don't get one of my books, but <laughs> you have a t shirt and a Yeti. <laughs> Hopefully, my next book will be out soon. It's written. I just got to get it published. What is that? Tell us about that before we get out of here. Um, it's called Sleepless Pills, and it is actually a collection of short stories. I actually write short stories a lot better than I write. Um, novels and so it's a most of them are stories that you've heard on either my channel or dixie cryptid they're all together in one book it's going to be released as uh an ebook if i get enough sales on the ebook i'll print i will have some printed but printing books when you're an independent can be really expensive and it's a big gamble as to whether or not you're going to sell them all and um, so I don't want to do that unless I make enough money on the eBooks to do that. Yeah, you have I to have that. Say, That's not yeah. <laughs> and I will say that um, um, the I just released a story this last month on Dixie Cryptid. Uh, it was narrated by him. And uh, it's called, I called it The Marsh. I think that he titled the episode Something Worse Than Bigfoot. And since I've had so many issues with formatting this, I may add that story to the book. Um, so, and of course, I've always got stories I'm writing. I do that constantly. I yeah, really don't know, that. Troy. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think my I'm going to be in Gatlinburg in July, but I'm not going to have a table or a booth. I'm just going to be wandering yeah. around. I'm going to um, probably You'll be hanging out with us. Yep. Hang out with uh, Wayne and Tiffany and Brian and um, uh, Mr. Tiffany. <laughs> um, you will be eating, uh, eating dinner with us later that yes, evening. I will. A dinner that Mr. Troy will be preparing. Yay. So yeah. um, I, I'm going to be doing the squatch out um, with you. And then mm -hmm. a week later or two weeks later, I will be in Ohio um, at the Ohio, um, the Spirit of the Forest 2024 mm -hmm. Bigfoot Festival. And I'm waiting. I'm I want to get a booth at um, the Montgomery Bell. Uh, cryptids mm. uh, conference. When is uh, that? There's a lot of people. That's in uh, uh, Burns, Tennessee, and that it's west of me. Mm. A lot of people mm -hmm. love to hear my Werewolf Springs story, and that's where Werewolf Springs is. So, now, when I, is that now? Oh, when is that? That is, I think, the week after the Ohio one. I think. Okay. I, I'm waiting. Um, I have to do things in, in bits and pieces. You know, poverty sucks. Don't be poor. Don't <laughs> be poor. You'd be rich. You'd be rich. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to do the drunk lady for the rest of my life. Um, but, uh, and it costs to, you know, it's expensive to get into these things. You have to pay for the booth and you have to pay. Oh, yeah. In this is particular case, I won't have to pay for a room because I can drive there <laughs> a couple of hours, an hour and a half, I think, and, and be back. But um, it's, uh, I, I want to get a booth there. Um, I'm trying to think, I have another speaking engagement, but I can't remember where it's at. Oh, that's so awful. You're busy lady. 
Yeah, I loved it. Give me a microphone and an audience and a locked door and you can't shut me up. Mm -hmm. And I won't let the audience get away either. And uh, so, yeah. yeah I probably love, love you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets a little old sometimes. My husband's like, it's three o'clock in the morning. She's still talking. What the heck? <laughs> So, what, uh, I well, uh, what I do my food is outside waiting on me so I'm going to go up there and get that and eat and uh, celebrate a mighty volunteer's victory and yes and is going to be there by the way I just saw that question or that statement alright well again thank you ma'am thanks so very much for hanging out with us tonight filling in on our picker head that canceled on us last minute and then blamed his cancellation on being upset that other people were canceling on him hmm oh no what sense does that make i'm available <laughs> <laughs> we always love having you on you're like <laughs> we yes, love having you, you i'll talk you know you have a standing invitation where i'm concerned now i'm yep. always willing to take you up on it so all right, you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. Love Bye. you. All right, how great is she? I love her. I'm just gonna, when I see her, when I see her in July, I'm just gonna hug her neck. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, man, uh, I can't. That's gonna be such a fun event. Get to hang out with her and you and everybody else all day at the event and then. Because the event is exhausting. I know Naomi can speak to it. It all day you're moving, meeting people, talking. It's it's exhausting. And then that evening, getting getting to unwind and eat a good dinner and maybe get to see drunk Naomi. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it's going to be going to be a really really good time. This was a good yeah. show. I, I always always enjoy having Naomi. Always. All right. You got okay. anything before we get out of here, man? I don't. Thank you again to Susan for joining, and we will see you Tuesday. Absolutely. Again, Susan is the lady that's putting on the event that Naomi and I will both be speaking at this year. Thank you so much for, for becoming a member, man. Everybody out there, thank you for hanging out. For everything that you do, all the support, we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Until we see you again. Y'all take care of yourself, take care of each other.